Chapter Fourteen of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Three, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Fourteen: Failure of Compromise. We have seen under what discouraging circumstances the House Committee of 33 entered upon its allotted work of preparing a Congressional Compromise. The extreme Southern members had in advance announced the futility of any such effort, while the central cabal of the conspirators, in open contempt of the Dunn Resolution, issued their secession manifesto of December 14th. Nevertheless, the committee continued to meet from time to time, and with commendable industry attacked the chaos of conflicting propositions referred to it by the House or submitted by its members. But a very few meetings rendered it evident that its labors were foredoomed to failure. Two of the members, Boyce of South Carolina and Hawkins of Florida, refused to attend even a single session. Reuben Davis of Mississippi attended to carry out his purpose which, as announced openly in the House, was to act as a spy upon its proceedings and to prevent its being made a means of deception to arrest the present noble and manly movements of the southern states. After the occupation of Sumter and the accession of the cabinet regime, with its change of policy and its earnest efforts in defense of the Union, the members of the committee from the cotton states, with the exception of Hamilton of Texas, absented themselves in a body. In so far, therefore, as it concerned the seceding states, the proceedings became a mere formality, since the faction designed to be conciliated refused to take part in or be bound by its transactions. If this maneuver on the part of the malcontents was designed to produce discord between Republicans and Union members from the border states, it failed of its object. The chairman, Thomas Corwin, was by nature a peacemaker, genial, eloquent, witty, and eminently conservative in temper and purpose. There were radically different views in the committee, which all discussion failed to harmonize in any effective shape, but the deliberations were amicable and furnished throughout no occasion for disruption or explosion. The general effect upon the border state men was undoubtedly good, and convinced them better than could have been done in the open house or by mere personal intercourse that the black Republicans were not so terrible as they had been painted. The border state men were, for the most part, sincere unionists. The only danger in their case was that they might take fright at merely imaginary intentions of radicalism ascribed so freely and so gratuitously by the South to the North. This danger the labors of the committee helped to dissipate, and, on the other hand, the designs of the fire-eaters themselves were cleverly unmasked by its proceedings. Charles Francis Adams, the Massachusetts member, submitted a resolution on the 8th of January affirming that the peaceful acquiescence in the election of a chief magistrate in accordance with every legal and constitutional requirement is the paramount duty of every good citizen of the United States. One would have thought that so simple and so sound a declaration could encounter no objection, but the uncertain temper of the times in matters of political faith and duty is illustrated in the fact that the Virginia member at once moved to amend by reducing the positive term, paramount duty, to the phrase, high and imperative duty. It was thus modified to meet tender Southern susceptibilities. But many who believed themselves conservatives shrank from even this diluted loyalty. Seven members from slave states entered on the journal of the committee their refusal to vote for it, on the ground that it did not tend to promote adjustment or contemplate congressional action. The sessions of the committee, doubtless hastened by the secession of state after state during the first fortnight of the new year, came to a termination with the report of the chairman on the 14th of January, 1861, with the explanation that, though not unanimous, a majority of a quorum had in each instance been obtained, he submitted to the House a series of six propositions as follows. First, a series of declaratory resolutions affirming in substance, one, slavery exists by law and usage in 15 states, and we recognize no outside authority to interfere with it. Two, the fugitive slave law should be faithfully executed. Three, there is no cause for dissolution of the union. Four, 
states must observe their constitutional obligations five the union must be preserved six personal liberty bills and kindred legislation should be revised and all rights of traveling or sojourning citizens of other states should be secured seven john brown raids should be prevented second a joint resolution requesting all states to revise their statutes and repeal all laws in conflict with or tending to hinder or embarrass the fugitive slave law third a bill to amend the fugitive slave law giving the fugitive a jury trial in the state from which he fled with aid of counsel and process for procuring evidence at the cost of the united states and to be delivered to claimant or returned to the place of arrest according to judgment at the expense of the united states fourth a bill to amend the act for the rendition of fugitives from justice giving federal judges instead of governors of states authority to act on requisitions fifth a bill to admit new mexico as a state with or without slavery sixth a joint resolution proposing an amendment to the constitution of the united states to the effect that no amendment to interfere with slavery within the states shall originate with any non-slaveholding state or become valid without the assent of every one of the states composing the union these propositions had undoubtedly been adopted in committee by the surrender of strong prejudices and feelings and as between members assenting to them formed a substantial compromise but accompanying this report of the chairman were no less than seven minority reports signed in the aggregate by fourteen members dissenting from the main report on grounds verging towards either extreme of the general dispute Add these fourteen dissenters to the habitual absentees representing the cotton states and it at once became manifest that the apparent majority report was in reality only an opinion of a minority of the committee and that as a practical fact and truthful basis of legislation the committee should simply have reported its inability to reach any mature and binding conclusion the review of the matter was tacitly taken by the house of representatives since these propositions were not brought to a vote in that body until near the close of the secession long after congressional compromise ceased to have any virtue as a healing remedy while mr corwin's report was purely negative while it shrank from truth and danger and so far from doing good was calculated still further to mislead the public into a false confidence his contact with the rebel sentiment of the committee had fully informed and awakened him to these startling signs of rebellion he communicated his foreboding in a private letter two days afterwards to the president-elect i have been for thirty days in a committee of thirty-three if the states are no more harmonious in their feelings and opinions than these thirty-three representative men then appalling as the idea is we must dissolve and a long and bloody civil war must follow i cannot comprehend the madness of the times southern men are theoretically crazy extreme northern men are practical fools the latter are really quite as mad as the former treason is in the air around us everywhere it goes by the name of patriotism men in congress boldly avow it and the public offices are full of acknowledged secessionists god alone i fear can help us four or five states are gone others are driving before the gale i have looked on this horrid picture till i have been able to gaze on it with perfect calmness i think if you live you may take the oath and at this point the sincere but despairing statesman not daring to trust himself in expressing his evident loss of faith in the union abruptly changes the subject the senate committee of thirteen fared no better it will be remembered that it was ordered by vote of the senate on december eighteenth and appointed by the vice president on the twentieth the announcement of the committee brought senator jefferson davis to his feet with a request that the senate would excuse him from serving the position which i am known to occupy he said and the position in which state i represent now stands render it altogether impossible for me to serve upon the committee with any prospect of advantage the senate voted to excuse him but on the following day to the general surprise it was moved to reconsider this vote in order that he might serve several republicans pressed for an explanation of this change of purpose when it came out that his friends from his section of the country entertaining the same opinions with himself had caucused with him on the subject and had prevailed upon him to withdraw his objections and go on the committee 
This action, although strange at the time, becomes intelligible enough when we remember that it occurred on and following the day of the South Carolina Secession Ordinance, while Mr. Buchanan was deliberating on Governor Pickens' letter demanding Sumter, and while Floyd was writing his surrender instructions. In short, when the conspirator's intrigue was in its most promising stage of progress. This being the situation, it was their manifest policy not only to keep a position which might furnish them useful information, but also lure on the administration with the tempting bait of compromise and to throw upon the Republicans and the North the burden of rejecting proffers of peace and goodwill. That Davis did not himself originally see the point was probably owing to a want of some information about the events occurring thick and fast at the moment he made his objection. That he appreciated the force of the advice is shown by his ready acceptance of it. It needed but little deliberation to develop the irreconcilable antagonism of principles and purposes which existed in the committee, and the record of its proceedings is of historical interest only so far as it shows the individual positions of such members as reduced their political schemes to writing and submitted them for its action. The following is believed to be a fair and brief summary of the proposed constitutional amendments in the order in which they were presented. Toombs Plan Recognition and protection to property in slaves everywhere except as limited and prohibited by state laws. Surrender of fugitive slaves without writ of habeas corpus or jury trial. No enactment of congressional laws concerning slavery without consent of a majority of senators and representatives from slaveholding states. No alteration of these or other constitutional provisions on slavery, except of the African slave trade, without consent of each and every slave state. Jefferson Davis's Plan Property in slaves shall stand on the same footing in all constitutional and federal relations as other property. Crittenden's Plan 1. Restoration and extension of the Missouri Compromise Line no abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia without compensation and voters' consent, or during its existence in Virginia and Maryland. No other congressional prohibition or abolition of slavery. Right of transportation and compensation for rescued fugitives. No future constitutional amendment to affect this or other slavery provisions. 2. Certain amendments of fugitive slave law, complete suppression of the African slave trade. 3. Prohibition of slavery north of 30 degrees, 30 minutes. Power to divide New Mexico at the discretion of Congress and admit states thus formed, with or without slavery. Douglas's Plan The status of each territory as now existing by law to remain unchanged, to be admitted as a state, with or without slavery, on attaining 50,000 population. Each territory, in the meanwhile, to have a delegate in the House and a delegate in the Senate. No further acquisition of territory except by a two-thirds vote of each House of Congress, its status when acquired to remain unchanged until it attains 50,000 population, then to become a territory, the judicial power and the fugitive slave law to apply to territories and new states. No elective or office-holding franchise for the African race. Power to acquire territory for colonization at government expense. No power to abolish slavery in federal places within slave states. No abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia without compensation or voters' consent, or during its existence in Virginia and Maryland. No congressional prohibition of transportation. Complete suppression of the African slave trade. Compensation for rescued fugitives. No future constitutional amendments on slavery. Seward's Plan no constitutional amendment to authorize Congress to abolish slavery in states, jury trial for fugitives, Congress to request a revision of obnoxious state legislation. Bigler's Plan Extension of line of 36 degrees 30 minutes with slavery and provision for four states south of it and freedom and provision for eight states north of it. No abolition in the District of Columbia while slavery exists in Maryland or Virginia. No future slavery amendments. Rice's Plan. Repeal all territorial governments. Divide the federal territories by the line of 36 degrees 30 minutes. Call that portion north of it the state of Washington and that south of it the state of Jefferson. Make provision in each case that whenever any portion within an area of 60,000 square miles 
contains one hundred and thirty thousand inhabitants a new state may be formed and admitted with such boundaries as congress may prescribe without examining in detail the votes on these varied and conflicting propositions it is enough to say that not a single one of them commended itself to the committee as a practical basis of compromise and after four meetings the chairman reported to the senate on the thirty first of december eighteen sixty that the committee have not been able to agree upon any general plan of adjustment so far therefore from bringing about harmony of views and action the labors of the committee of thirteen had served only to define and sharpen political differences notwithstanding all this discouragement however the idea of compromise was clung to with tenacity the declared conviction of parties as they stood admitted of no arrangement but it was argued that extreme views should not be permitted to plunge the country into civil war the necessity for agreement was freely conceded but the embarrassment of the situation lay in the difficulty of defining who it was that held the extreme views which were to be abandoned the politicians and representative men of the border states were naturally most anxious and officious in the interest of a compromise the border states had a close interest and sympathy with the south because like them they possessed the institution of slavery and were therefore sensitive to whatever touched or threatened its welfare or safety but they were also bound to the north by advantages of commerce and intercourse and their personal and political relationships extended alike to each section moreover they rightly divined that in case of a conflict they would be apt to become the heaviest sufferers since their soil must be the inevitable battlefield to these motives were added that of appreciating the varied benefits of the general government and the patriotic one of sincerely entertaining a deep-seated attachment to the union it has been stated that boteler of virginia and powell of kentucky were the originators of these two committees of congress the real leader of the compromise movement in its larger aspect was senator john j crittenden of kentucky his seventy-two years made him venerable in appearance he had been in addition to holding lesser offices a member of two cabinets governor of his state and six times senator of the united states his full sheaf of political honors justly rendered him a man of national rank and authority without the brilliant qualities of clay he was deemed the most acceptable successor to that eminent statesman and he now hoped to repeat the latter's memorable public service in stilling the great political storm of eighteen fifty three days after the report of the committee of thirteen mr crittenden once more brought forward his compromise plan previously submitted both to the senate and to the committee which declared that provision ought to be made by law without delay for taking the sense of the people and submitting to their vote the following resolutions as the basis for the final and permanent settlement of these disputes that now disturb the peace of the country and threaten the existence of the union sir said he in explanation it may be that we are spellbound in our party politics and in opinions which they have generated and fastened and bound upon us against our will but i appeal with confidence to that great source from which we derive our power when the people are in danger and the people's institutions i appeal with confidence to them if we are at fault if we cannot combine the requisite majority here to propose amendments to the constitution which may be necessary to the settlement of our present difficulties the people can give us their voice and their judgment and they will be our safest guides considering mr crittenden's representative character his far-reaching political influence his unconditional devotion to the union his honorable record against the abrogation of the missouri compromise and against the lecompton fraud his condemnation of the heresy of secession and non-coercion and in addition to all his persuasive eloquence in private and in public great hopes were for a while entertained that his name and figure would become a successful rallying point for agreement persons who thought this however failed to note the well-defined attitudes to which the contending parties had separated mr crittenden's plan was brought to a test vote on the sixteenth of january two days after the report of the house committee of thirty three its main feature was the reenactment of the missouri compromise which had been repealed at mr douglas's insistence and the application of its provisions to all remaining federal territory that is 
that slavery should exist south of the line thirty six degrees thirty minutes and be prohibited north of it the resolutions also provided that the prohibition should extend to future acquisitions north of the line and upon motion of mr powell an amendment was adopted that slavery should also exist in future acquisitions south of the line it has been argued in favor of the plan that it definitely settled the status of all federal territory but under this amendment the plan became what would be simply the preliminary chapter of a new conflict between the sections for a new balance or a preponderance of power through annexation this was pouring oil on the fire instead of quenching it the republican senators and the republican party that had won the presidential victory at the november election upon the distinct issue of no extension of slavery could not accept the proposition in this shape they could not even do so without the powell amendment they were compelled to insist that the south must submit to the legally expressed will of the majority to recede from this was not only the destruction of the republican party it was the abandonment of government the republican senators therefore laid down their ultimatum in an amendment offered by mr clark of new hampshire to strike out the crittenden resolutions and amendment and substitute the following declaration that the provisions of the constitution are ample for the preservation of the union and the protection of all the material interests of the country that it needs to be obeyed rather than amended and that an extrication from our present dangers is to be looked for in strenuous efforts to preserve the peace protect public property and enforce the laws rather than in new guarantees for particular interests compromises for particular difficulties or concessions to unreasonable demands that all attempts to dissolve the present union or overthrow or abandon the present constitution with the hope or expectation of constructing a new one are dangerous illusory and destructive that in the opinion of the senate of the united states no such reconstruction is practicable and therefore to the maintenance of the existing union and the constitution should be directed all the energies of all the departments of the government and the efforts of all good citizens if the republicans were not willing to accept the crittenden compromise the extreme southern senators were still less so upon the question being taken in the senate six of the latter refused to vote and thus took upon themselves the responsibility of effectually killing the crittenden resolutions by allowing the clark substitute to be adopted yeas twenty five nays twenty three the conspirators acted on the assumption that their plans were now sufficiently ripe to enable them to venture on so bold an expedient mr crittenden was greatly cast down by the result but not yet entirely despondent notice was given of a motion to reconsider the vote and on the following day he telegraphed to friends in north carolina in reply the vote against my resolutions will be reconsidered their failure was the result of the refusal of six southern senators to vote there is yet good hope of success the conspirators were however not only better informed but inflexibly resolved that so far at least as they were concerned the veteran statesman's prediction should not be verified compromise thus twice defeated was nevertheless so prevalent an idea or rather seemed so necessary an expedient that it once more made its appearance in a new shape and again for a season claimed the attention of the country and of congress through the deliberations of an assembly somewhat anomalous in character and authority known to history as the peace convention the particulars of its origin have never been made public though it is stated that the call was mainly the work of ex-president tyler on the nineteenth of january the legislature of virginia passed a series of resolutions inviting the other states of the union to send commissioners to meet in washington on the fourth day of february to unite with virginia in an earnest effort to adjust the present unhappy controversies in the spirit in which the constitution was originally formed and consistently with its principles so as to afford to the people of the slaveholding states adequate guarantees for the security of their rights one of the resolutions suggested the crittenden plan as a basis of such adjustment if the convention should recommend amendments to the federal constitution it was to communicate them to congress for the purpose of having the same submitted by that body to the several states for ratification the resolutions further provided that in the meanwhile ex-president tyler should call upon president buchanan 
and judge john robertson should visit the seceded states to induce both parties to abstain from a collision of arms the result of tyler's mission has already been mentioned buchanan professing to have no authority to bind the hands of the government nevertheless gave an implied promise by sending a special message to congress transmitting the virginia resolutions and asking that body to abstain from legislation calculated to produce a collision of arms during the contemplated convention judge robertson's visit to the seceded states proved worse than barren the cotton states were all willing enough to promise to keep the peace because they had already made their movement seizing the forts and arsenals and were now standing on the defensive as to commissioners they promised to send them to montgomery instead of washington replies made by governors and legislatures were framed not to promote union but to work on the sympathies of virginia for rebellion and had their intended effect starting out as an apostle robertson came home a pervert so far as my opportunities have enabled me to judge says his report the people and authorities of the southern confederacy are resolved inflexibly and with unparalleled unanimity to meet all the consequences of the step they have taken judging from the same opportunities i believe that at this time they ardently desire to be reunited with the states whose institutions interests rights and feelings are similar to their own with those states and with them only for virginia most especially they express and manifest the highest respect and deference they are to a far greater extent than i had ever conceived by birth bone of her bone and flesh of her flesh her ancient flame they regard as their rightful inheritance when the peace convention organized commissioners from fourteen states namely rhode island new jersey delaware maryland new hampshire vermont connecticut pennsylvania virginia north carolina ohio indiana iowa and kentucky appear to take their seats at subsequent periods seven additional states tennessee massachusetts missouri new york maine illinois and kansas also sent commissioners so that before the close of the proceedings twenty-one states were represented some of the commissioners having been appointed by the legislatures and others by the governors the body was not only respectable in the standing and talents of its members but comprised many names highest in leadership lot m morrill of maine george s boutwell of massachusetts david dudley field of new york frederick t Frelinghuysen of new jersey david wilmont of pennsylvania reverdy johnson of maryland george w summers of virginia james guthrie of kentucky salmon p chase of ohio stephen t logan of illinois james harlan of iowa and others but from the first it was a half-hearted lame and deceptive movement the very conditions of its existence crippled and paralyzed it the call was to afford to the people of the slaveholding states adequate guarantees for the security of their rights the northern states denied any such necessity they thought they saw in this scheme only a new effort on the part of the slaveholding interests to extort that which it had failed to gain at the polls and by the subsequent threat and movement of secession there was considerable hesitation in sending northern delegates and it was finally done merely to parry misconstruction and the imputation of sectional hostility the representation was incomplete california oregon minnesota michigan and wisconsin were absent from the north the seven seceded states and arkansas from the south the assemblage had neither legal authority nor full popular confidence it adopted the absurd and illogical method of voting by states thereby reducing its representative character at least one half and setting each separate delegation into active discord it developed all the usual weaknesses of deliberative bodies irrelevant talk personal jealousy and parliamentary tricks its worst derelictions however were the prevailing vices of the period want of candor and the evasion of palpable and overshadowing interests ex-president tyler was called upon to preside over the convention and guthrie of kentucky placed at the head of the leading committee by february fifteenth this committee reported a series of propositions to form a constitutional amendment the chief feature of which was a reenactment of the missouri compromise in other words to divide the present territories by the parallel of thirty six degrees thirty minutes prohibiting slavery north and permitting it south of that line 
and imposing such restrictions upon the acquisition of new territory as to amount to a virtual interdiction these with a number of secondary features and several minority reports and amendments were debated until the twenty seventh when these main features of the committee's project were substantially adopted by the close vote of nine states in the affirmative and eight states in the negative according to this vote it seemed that the convention had agreed upon the crittenden plan but the result was only an apparent one the previous afternoon february twenty sixth had demonstrated the failure of the convention for on that day a test vote was taken and the line of thirty six degrees thirty minutes rejected eight to eleven delaware kentucky maryland new jersey ohio pennsylvania rhode island and tennessee voting aye connecticut illinois iowa maine massachusetts missouri new york north carolina new hampshire vermont and virginia voting no the sentiment and attitude of the members may be classified under four heads one a very small minority of the southerners demanding extreme concessions to slavery and as the alternative bent on secession two republicans who demanded acquiescence in lincoln's election three southern unionists asking moderate guarantees for slavery but who could not promise that guaranteeing them would bring back the seceded states four northern unionists willing to concede almost anything for compromise this divergence of opinion rendered the action of the convention wholly negative every proposition met abundant objection but no sufficient support troublesome queries were thrust aside not answered the convention would vote neither on the right of secession nor on the duty of coercion all these circumstances of course lessened the public interest in its final action the deliberations were held with closed doors but the substance of its daily proceedings found report in the leading newspapers the rejection of the line of thirty six degrees thirty minutes on february twenty sixth was the logical termination of its labors and precisely what produced the reversal of its action and the adoption of that identical plan on the following day has never been satisfactorily explained the journals show that the vote of illinois was changed the vote of new york not counted merely upon technical grounds and the vote of missouri not cast for reasons not being given an adjourned evening meeting and some informal caucusing which intervened both of which are mentioned may have had their occult influence at all events the change of attitude and the adoption of a positive proposition was merely formal and reflected neither the conviction nor will of the convention the affirmative vote being less than a majority of the states represented nevertheless it was treated as a genuine compromise a hundred guns were fired to celebrate the event and the proposed amendment was gravely transmitted to congress only five days of the session yet remained and the house refused even to receive it in the senate it elicited some debate and mr crittenden assumed its championship moving to substitute it for his own renewed and pending proposition the senate however clearly understood its worthlessness and by eyes seven nose twenty eight voted down the amendment end of chapter fourteen